flow, energy. Misnomers on the United States. We are totally dependent on oil to run our economy. We get all of it from Saudi Arabia. Turns out the biggest source of energy for America is America. And it's getting even better with the shale gas revolution, fracking. Second biggest source, North America. Third biggest source, South America. Fourth biggest source, Africa. Persian Gulf doesn't show up till the fifth. And now China is a bigger customer than the United States for Saudi Arabia. Persian Gulf sends the bulk of its gas and oil this way. China, Asia sucking up oil and gas from Africa, coal and gas from that part of the world, oil and gas from both Americas, oil and gas from Russia. I mean, there graphically is kind of where globalization is gone. It's centered there in terms of energy. The Europeans draw from their traditional places. Russia, big exporter on nukes. Point of this slide, Asia's the new global demand center. World revolves around Asia. That means Asia's got to buy from everywhere, get along with everywhere, or suffer its instabilities. Not an advantage. We look at this somehow as an advantage for the Chinese. This is the same terrible burden we had for a long time. But it's not unnatural facing that burden to build carriers and do other things. Whether that's appropriate for the future security threat environment, I could make a different argument. But the instinct is correct. Why are we getting all this energy consumption? Today, the world is half rural, half urban. In terms of the global population, that's 3.3 billion in the countryside, 3.3 billion in the cities. 2050, look what happens. We decrease that number, we keep that number, and then how about we double it in 40 years? We take about 6,000 years to get the first 3 billion, and we're going to do the next 3 billion in about 400, or excuse me, 40 years. Absolutely amazing. That's 75 million new urbanites every year for 40 years. Bulk of it, Asia, Africa, or half the cities now are slums. So huge challenges. But this is how it works out in terms of the infrastructure. These are gargantuan numbers. 2005, 2030, three big regions. We'll look at it vertically. There are the numbers. $23 trillion on water. People at GE will tell you, all I got to do is water in China for the next 30 years. And I'm a big company. There's electricity, $9 trillion. And there's $10 trillion of transportation, over $40 trillion in a quarter century. Absolutely amazing. So think of globalization as this process of successful replication. It begins in the European construct. They successfully replicate in North America. They try it elsewhere through colonialization and screw the pooch just about everywhere. We succeed. Why? We snapped it off as early as possible. Then after Europe self-destructs in a massive civil war, 1914 to 1945, we become the integrating agent of note. And war is attached to that process. Defeated Japan, um, Korea, Vietnam. How attached and how useful the wars are, another question. But wars tend to accompany the process because there is tremendous churn. So when you ask yourself, who's going to take care of the rest of my gap, you're looking at three different contenders. But there are three different points in history. My favorite example, using the car industry, automobile, French word, German invention. 20th century, America. Where's the center of the global car market? China, Asia, now. How do I know this? 606 cars per 1,000 people in Europe, 961 in America, 40. Already, GM makes more money here than anywhere else in the world. So GM's tomorrow is in Asia. GM's today is Asia. So who's going to integrate my gap? No question about it. It's going to be the Asians. We're too busy, too expensive. Europeans too uh, busy getting retired, I think. And yeah, they got a car for it. It's the Tata Nano. 2,000 bucks. It's a total piece of crap. <laughs> got no air conditioning, got no power, anything. No radio, nothing. I emphasize the voluntary recalls at first are minimal. But if you're driving a motorcycle in a developing country with your wife on the back, your two kids, and a chicken, 
for a couple of grand, this is amazing. This is transformative. Tata's selling them like hotcakes despite all the problems. So how I look at Africa, which is ground zero on my mind for globalization's replication right now. Is it going to be done by America? No, it's going to be done by others. But it's not going to be a non-messy project. History tells us the more squiggly your borderlines are, the more stable your country. Okay? Either you fought to make them squiggly or there's a river or a mountain or something. Good example. This is the 9th Congressional District, Illinois. <laughs> no, it's actually Chile. Here's my subdivision. No, it's actually Jordan. So real country, fake creation, the bits left over. First they called it Transjordan because they didn't even know what to call it. They just said that part over there near the river. So who's stable and who's unstable? Not a lot of wars in Chile. Squiggly lines are the best predictor of stability. Here's the underlying reality in terms of tribes going way, way back. Here are the lines the Europeans drew. They oddly correspond to longitude and latitude. They have almost no bearing on the underlying reality whatsoever. Here's a line I want you to think about. It's a line where you transition from one sort of reality to the other. And it corresponds, unsurprisingly, to the underlying environment. This is mostly a predominantly Muslim north. Doesn't mean there's no Christians up there. But it's predominantly Muslim. And if you live in a predominantly Christian society, you know it's not a predominantly Muslim one. And the South is different. So think about the fault line countries and you will find all of them experiencing instability in the last five to ten years. We see these splits even where it's stable. Here's the most recent election in Nigeria. Good luck Jonathan took the entire South. Landslide. Except he didn't win any of the North. He's a Christian. That's all the Christian South. The guy who lost was a Muslim. That's all the Muslim North. Now, I'm not predicting violence on the basis simply of that reality. I'm saying when globalization comes in and changes things, people get in fights. And when they get in fights, identities tend to matter. When you get in the bar fight and everybody's throwing glasses and whatnot, you tend to go to those in the same uniform. And these are big uniforms. But I'd like to point out, America did similar things in terms of its squiggly and straight line states. Here's the original 13 colonies. Kids can pick them out. Here's how we did the Trans-Appalachian West. Two big lines basically draw everything. Mississippi, Ohio. Look what happens when we get in a hurry. <laughs> Let me show you all the thought that went into Colorado. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of thought. I'm sure the Native Americans appreciated it. The trick, 1870s America. We were the China of our age. We're exporting beer to Germany, just like the Chinese are exporting tequila to Mexico right now. We were a with it rising country. Everybody was afraid of us. We were the future. But we had to integrate this crazy West at the same time. Okay. So not only are we the China of the future building the biggest, coolest things like the Brooklyn Bridge, engineering marvel of its age. Building it right through our centennial, 1876. Two weeks earlier, Custer buys it in Little Bighorn in our federally administered tribal area. Place so dangerous we can't even send our military there. Where have you heard that line? So we're not just the China of our age, we're the Pakistan of our age. And I guarantee you, if Crazy Horse can get on a plane and fly to London and blow himself up, boy, that's a different America in terms of its relationship with the outside world. So these are not new things. These are sped up things, but they're not new. So here's how things are going to happen in Africa. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't, but this is the basic idea. You've got straight line countries. Globalization comes in. Things start to break up. Who wants out of the relationship? Always the most ambitious. Who wanted out of Iraq? The Kurds. Who wanted out of the Balkans? The Slovenes and the Croatians. They wanted to get rid of the losers, cut their own deal with the outside world. I want a divorce. If it goes badly, you start fighting over the kids. That's called ethnic cleansing. If you're lucky, you get a good lawyer. 
manages the process, keeps the violence from getting too bad, you start reconnecting politically over time like they have in the Balkans. Why are they connected now in the Balkans? The vast bulk of the trade with every country is with all their neighbors. So of course they have to get along after a while. How you jump the chasm, historically single party models. So don't wish for democracy too fast. Wish for a middle class before. Understand we get called in when things go bad on this side. And guess who shows up when things start getting good on the other side? That is a silent partnership, an LLC that we don't like to talk about. But we got it right now in Africa. We're interested in the Paul Mill, they're interested in the stock. There's the logic that we're going to have to pursue over time. As this part of the world fractures, breaks up, more countries are born, not just South Sudan, you're going to have to create overarching economic unions. And they're going to have to connect the interior to the exterior, like the EAC tries to do over here. That's the future. And why do you need to connect the interior to the exterior? That's where you're going to get your democratic impulse, because you've got your middle class congregated, unsurprisingly, on the coast.